Okay, so let's begin. In the last class, we uh, discussed some essential maths for NLP. Today, some essential linguistics for NLP. Hmm? So, two classes devoted to essential maths, essential linguistics, but of course, we will keep referring to them and elaborating them as we go ahead in the uh, course. So, by way of recap, you would recall that uh, in the discussion on essential maths for NLP, we said that uh, probability plays a very, very important role. Okay? And uh, the metaphor which was borrowed from uh, speech into NLP is noisy channel. And in case of noisy channel, we uh, compute a conditional probability, probability of the tag sequence given the word sequence, probability of the answer given the uh, question, probability of the Hindi sentence given the English sentence, everywhere we see the role of probability. And that conditional probability is uh, converted to prior probability and likelihood by the application of Bayes theorem. And once we apply Bayes theorem, then we have probability values of large uh, sequences of random variables which we uh, break into smaller, uh, you know, a product of small uh, random variables, small number of random variables by a chain rule. So, chain rule is another very important tool, mathematical tool, which we need for uh, NLP. Then uh, many times we have to introduce a new random variable. So, that is when we compute the total probability through marginalization. And, uh, uh, and the application of these in NLP was seen by introducing features. Okay? So, when we produce uh, you know, uh, any kind of labeling which is discriminative and we would like to uh, produce the uh, sequ level sequence okay, depending on the position, then with the position we associate features. The words are also features and parts of words are also features. So, th there we introduced uh, by marginalization features associated with a position. Okay? And uh, that uh, introduced uh, the summation of features, sets of features and then we had to apply some Markov assumptions and so on. And so, Markov assumption also is a very important uh, conceptual tool for us. Then uh, maximum likelihood is always at the background because you have to compute uh, probability values as parameters and they are ratios of counts. So, ratio of count is the best possible uh, option you can take because of the principle of maximum likelihood. I mean if 10, ha uh, if you have sh thrown a coin 100 times and head appears let us say 45 times then we say that the probability of head is 0.45. Now, uh, there is a guarantee that this is the best possible estimate of the parameter, okay, the best possible estimate of the probability of head from the coin. You cannot do better than this. Okay, so, MLE gives you the best possible estimate. Now, the natural question that will arise th is that what are the alternatives to MLE? Okay, if I do not take ratio, what else can I do? So, you can, uh, <clears throat> the other principle you can make use of is uh, maximum entropy. Okay? And you can maximize the entropy subject to constraints. That would be a bit cumbersome. So, that would give you estimate of the probability. We can also do Gibbs sampling, which again is a, a kind of entropy based method. And then we can do Bayesian estimation. Okay, so, all those alternatives exist and uh, it is a nice uh, fundamental proof to show that it is maximum likelihood, namely the ratio of counts, a very simple measure in the form of ratio of counts, which gives you the best possible estimate of the uh, probability value. You cannot do better than this. Okay? So, this is, uh, this is very nice and we make apply this in, in NLP. In situations like what is the probability of getting a verb after an adverb or an adverb after a noun and so on. Okay? So, those values come from the corpus. Now, we should also remember that 
without data probability has no meaning okay without data probability has no meaning so that is due to what principle that is due to law of large numbers so i should have mentioned this here law of large numbers and central limit theorem so this was one kind of mathematical tool which we uh, discussed last time and of course there is expectation maximization which gave rise to a very solid uh, basis for creating word alignments okay from parallel sentences you can create word alignments so this is uh, a set of tools there are many more but these are essential uh, in nlp the other uh, sets of tools come from linear algebra okay especially matrices and one of the matrices which is uh, very uh, uh, sacrosanct in nlp is uh, co occurrence matrix so you uh, you take words in the rows and take same words in the columns and find out how many times a a word wi appears with wj so how many times does uh, strong appear with t strong t and how many times does powerful appear with t can we say after going from office i like to drink some strong t can we say after going from office i would like to drink some powerful tea those strong and powerful are synonymous in some situations okay so uh, so uh, how many times does strong okay so another set of tools comes from matrices linear algebra so word by word co occurrence matrix okay so for example run slowly run quickly these are co occurrences then uh, when we when we have this kind of matrices Uh, we would like to apply factorization okay on the matrices so uh, matrix factorization in the form of uh, principal component analysis singular value decomposition these are also important uh, you know concepts and useful concepts for natural language processing so uh, let us remember this list of techniques and we see their application as we go along okay it is good to remember that we had seen these mathematical concepts so now we move to uh, essential linguistic concepts reminding ourselves that we have seen this picture two pillars of nlp are linguistics and probability but finally of course everything uh, is uh, fructified in the form of a code okay uh, this is the code which is running on a powerful system doing something very useful like a chatbot or an info, intelligent information retrieval system okay or a translator and so on so essential linguistics <clears throat> now let's take a historical look at it and uh, have get a sense of uh, time okay so we start from the start of cre creation itself okay big bang is said to have occurred 13.8 billion years ago this is you know unimaginably ancient then uh, when when did human beings uh, appear on earth about 300000 years ago 3 lakh years when did homo erectus arrive that is uh, entities which could walk straight with their head up they arrived about uh, 200000 years ago 2 lakh years when did civilization start about uh, 4000 to 3000 before christ so that would be about uh, 6000 years back okay from now and what is the meaning of start of civilization the start of civilization is linked to it uh, discovery of fire and use of fire okay and then uh, this was attended with uh, cooking starting of family living in villages and so on so that was about uh, 6000 uh, 6000 years back when did linguistic start the time is placed at uh, 6th century bc okay so about uh, 2000 years back and it is said to have been started with uh, panini okay who is uh, one of the colossal figures in linguistics when was systematic uh, enquiry started of questions like why a stone falls down when the while steam rises up 
why does stone fall down while steam rise up okay so questions on nature questions physics biology chemistry so that started about 1500 ad with the systematic enquiry of why nature behaves the way it does so galileo was 1564 to 1642 newton 1642 to 1727 okay so this is a kind of timeline and we are talking of uh, billions of years ago when creation started so uh, linguistics is about uh, 2000 years old okay mathematics is also about 2000 years old probability is about uh, 3 to 400 years old okay the notion of probability notion of uh, you know dealing with uncertainty in a formal manner so linguistics is much much older surely and uh, and it is said that this is the first uh, sign of uh, systematic enquiry into a phenomenon okay linguists are actually data scientists what they do is that they collect data on language behavior how many times uh, does adjective appear before noun okay predominantly we see adjectives coming before noun so give a rule that when you write a sentence and you want to qualify the noun place the qualifier before the noun what about adverbs which qualify verbs they come after the verb okay so these are questions on structure and sequence so these are linguistic enquiries we would like to remember that linguists actually collect data they are data scientists okay and then they apply generalizations and insight into the phenomena to produce rules the only difference is that uh, the linguistic rules are stated in very certain manner adjective should always come before the noun but not always not so especially in case of ungrammatical sentences maybe not or if you want to emphasize something then you place the adjective in another place okay so there you are disturbing the canonical order so the problem was that uh, probability was not accommodated in the whole theory so let's look at some of the tools we need from there now nacl uh, is a very flagship conference in natural language processing acl nacl these are flagship conferences because that is where the uh, you know cutting edge results are presented so there was this panel discussion the place of linguistics and symbolic structures in natural language processing and all the names are very uh, well known well established researchers dan roth from urbana champaign was the moderator of the uh, panel discussion so the widespread adoption of neural models in nlp research and the fact that nlp applications increasingly mediate people's lives have prompted many discussions about what productive research directions might look like for our community since nsl is a meeting of chapter of the association of computational linguistics we would like to highlight specifically the role that linguistics and symbolic structures can play or not in shaping these research directions okay, clearly a very 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 live topic for language processing then these names chitto boral emily bender uh, uh, dilek hakkani christopher manning they are all very well known researchers they gave their opinions so chitto boral said that uh, the symbolic structures are important symbolic knowledge and structure can help in creating better data sets that we know that we have remarked when we talked about the two pillars of uh, natural language processing we said that annotated data cannot be created without linguistic insight uh, for example common sense facts and common sense reasoning requires symbolic structures predicate calculus for example and uh, uh, and producing annotated data emily bender said use the scholarship in linguistics for research in nlp structural linguistics morphology syntax semantics linguistic pragmatics child language acquisition linguistic typology social linguistics these are the you know big branches of linguistics and th there is a huge accumulated scholarship here so it will be uh, 
really quite, uh, you know, uh, quite stupid, I would say, not to use the scholarship for our system development. Sociolinguistics can be useful for reasoning about potential harms of language technology that we are seeing around us now. Okay, the problem of bias, fake news, etc., hallucination from large language models. Okay, we know these are life problems, actual problems. And social linguistics has tools and techniques for dealing with such problems. In fact, algorithms and uh, machine learning models which uh, come, which are created for dealing with fake news have to make use of social linguistics insights. Okay, what constitutes fake news? Why is it a fake news? Hate speech, bias. Bias is such a social, uh, socially uh, relevant phenomenon. Bias always exists. Now, if large language models also show bias because they are trained on data from society, so what can be done? We, have, we need you know, countermeasures for this. So they come from social linguistics. So Dilek Hakani emphasized challenges related to dialogue systems and how symbolic structures and knowledge grounding can be useful to address them. So uh, we have all seen how effective uh, chat GPT is in carrying out meaningful conversation. Okay, you can go on asking questions and giving responses. Chat GPT behaves all, almost like a human being, except for uh, you know mathematical reasoning, deep reasoning, long context, which is where this runs into problem. So dialogue systems need symbolic structures and knowledge grounding because general purpose. Uh, uh, dialogue systems are not very uh, proficient in handling domain specific knowledge. Okay, for example, you cannot carry out a deep conversation with chat GPT on cancer okay? or uh, about uh, let us say some political event okay, which has ramifications for whole society. You cannot carry out such meaningful conversations for a long time. <laughs> And uh, chat GPT also gets confused on uh, mathematical conclusions. I mean, if you uh, ask chat GPT to, to regenerate answer, it often produces different answers for the same mathematical question. Christopher Manning, fundamental concepts of linguistics are becoming more important in deep learning research in general and used to understand human intelligence. Children can learn language without any expertise in linguistics. Okay. So this is a common observation, which is what gave rise to the theory of universal grammar and innateness hypothesis. We are born with linguistic abilities, okay, which is uh, a, a counter theory to behaviorism, that we acquire language by interaction with the environment. So there are very interesting pieces of work to show that uh, language uh, does not evolve by interaction with the environment, it is as if we cannot help grow language, just like we cannot help growing limbs, okay, hands, feet, eyes, ears, we cannot help growing them, they spontaneously grow. Similarly, language ability also develops and grows spontaneously, we just cannot help it. So we have to take inspiration from linguistic theory and concepts such as compositionality systematic generalization, stable meaning for symbols and manipulating reference. However, we should focus on the representation of meaning directly rather than language itself, which ap appears as an indirect representation. So uh, this has reference to what is called meaning continuum. Okay? So when we hear a particular word, the, the concept that arises in our mind okay, relates to several other concepts. When we hear of dog, automatically the concept of barking also comes to our mind. So we seem to navigate a conceptual space okay, uh, which, which does not have abrupt boundaries. We effortlessly flow from one concept to another. So that is required in uh, representing language. So now, <coughs> uh, what is language? So we are, we are you know, discussing some essential concepts of linguistics for NLP. Language is a system of communication consisting of sound, word, and grammar. Hmm? 
she does research into how children ac acquire language. It is a system of communication used by people living in a particular country. Do you speak any foreign languages? A system of symbols and rules for writing instructions for computers. So when we uh, hear a new language and we try to make sense of language, we are doing a very intelligent activity. Namely, we are doing some kind of decoding, okay, decoding of signals. So uh, a system of symbols and rules for writing instructions for computers, Java and Perl are both important computer programming languages. And uh, we should uh, distinguish between a language with capital L and language with small l, the special words and phrases used by people who do a particular type of work. So legal or technical language, rude or offensive words. My mother would not let us watch it because of the language. Here, uh, the, the concept of language is an abstract large entity, not a particular language. So when we say Hungarian language, there we have to use small l. And language as an entity, we have to use capital L. So language has these properties of displacement, arbitrariness, productivity, cultural transmission, discreteness, duality. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back to these points off and on. Now displacement I always find as a very intriguing ability because in displacement we can displace ourselves in time and place. Okay, I need not be present in London but I can talk about London. I need not be present in future or past but I can talk about future and past. There are proved studies that animals cannot talk about future and past. Okay, they cannot signif they cannot denote or they cannot communicate about future and past in their language, nor can they talk about a different place. For animal communication, it is always now and here. It is always now and here. It is the unique ability of human language to be able to express displacement in time and sp uh, place. And then these uh, properties of arbitrariness, etc., etc., we'll keep referring to as we go forward. So uh, the theory of linguistics co is concerned with what is language, what are its el elements, how do these elements combine, are there universals of language, relation between language and reality, insight into life, society and its processes. Okay? So first and foremost, language is a huge algorithmic system, a huge computing system in our mind. Okay, so computation of uh, language is manipulation of symbols. Now, uh, application of linguistics is in pedagogy, language teaching, okay, learning of a language. Uh, in a medical domain, we see the application of linguistics in speech therapy, for example. Uh, in engineering, use and use, useful system building, natural language processing with many impactful applications, applied machine learning. Machine learning researchers call natural language processing as applied machine learning. Uh, what is possible to implement, how to annotate data, how to spot and analyze error, these are the applications of linguistics in engineering. Now the que question, a question sometimes is asked that do we need to uh, understand linguist to, linguistics to create natural language processing system. So uh, the analogy is with uh, uh, aerospace engineering or aeronautical engineering. It is not necessary to understand the uh, flight of bird to, to construct an aeroplane. Okay? But the fact remains that the study of flight, understanding what, what does it mean to fly, started with the study of how birds fly. Okay? And this whole science of flying what underlies, what scientific laws and rules underlie flying, that came from the study of birds. And then many of those principles were applied to construct this uh, machinery through engineering called aeroplanes. Now innateness of language ability. Innateness hypothesis holds that humans are born with at least some knowledge of linguistic structure. So one of my favorite examples is that when we do form questions, okay, we always bring the verb to the front, either through the auxiliary or uh, the main verb itself comes to the front. 
in in with several languages okay in german for example the verb comes to the front i know how to you, you know how to swim in english do you know how to swim in german this will become know you how to swim that means do you know how to swim okay in uh, indian languages we introduce some fo form of the wh word right kya kya aap tairna jante ho apni ki satar karte janen in bengali okay so uh, so so my favorite example is that uh, children never make any mistake with respect to which verb should be fronted okay if there are two verbs in a sentence how can there be two verbs in a sentence there is one main clause and one subordinate clause the fro the verb inside the subordinate clause never comes to the front of the sentence children never make this mistake so that's a very intriguing uh, fact right why is it that they never make this mistake what do i mean by this so the boy who lives in delhi will come tomorrow so there are two verbs lives and come so children never bring leaves to the front of the sentence how do they get this knowledge they they are told that to form interrogatives you have to bring the verb to the front how come they always bring the correct verb the verb in the main clause to the front that's very intriguing so this has been proved many times through study of child language development so it means that children have some kind of sense of structure which uh, becomes more and more apparent as they age now of course here you can have a behavioristic objection you can say that children never hear an example of a sentence or a question where the subordinate clause verb comes to the front they never hear this that's why so that's a valid objection they never hear this therefore they do not make that mistake so when they are told to front the verb they always hit up on the uh, main clause verb but the fact remains that this structure whether innate or acquired they become sensitive to this structure okay then the innateness hypothesis due to noam chomsky which is a colossal name again in linguistics okay he argued that language is not a uh, not a reactive process not a reactive or proactive process it is an innate ability okay uh, one of the best examples of acquiring and internalizing word relative syntactic regularity child language acquisition so uh, children typically use a single word sentences initially and then they begin to make two word three word sentences so so if they are asking for the train for from the mother or want to show their mother the train or they are asking their father to play why is it that the subject always goes before the predicate okay the subject verb goes before the verb always mama train papa play okay so this is the predominant sentence construction who told them that subject should precede the predicate subject should come before the verb subject precedes object subject precedes verb where do they get that uh, knowledge from very early in their life okay so child language acquisition uh, throws light into many innate processes so nlp is language plus computation linguistics and probability nlp layers are these now there are two kinds of linguistics descriptive which describes language as they are okay so if i am while talking if i am making a mistake a grammatical mistake or pronunciation mistake that mistake is real okay and an nlp system suppose an nlp system is now installed in your device okay and it is trying to create a meaning graph out of whatever i am saying it will create a conceptual graph so even if my i am making grammatical mistakes in my sentences it should be able to process that uh, wrong sentence and still produce a meaning graph so nothing is discarded in descriptive linguistics 
in prescriptive linguistics we specify that this 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 is what should be the correct language construct we prescribe this so that is what english teachers or hindi teachers or any language teacher would tell us okay i did not see nobody in the hall is supposed to be wrong we are told in the school but actually there are many many dialects of english where double negative is allowed and it is a reality okay then you will have to create systems which deal with that reality otherwise you are shutting the system to or closing the eyes of the system to some real behavior now difference between western linguistics and indian linguistics so in india we saw the world's first systematic study of language through the work of yashko panini bhartri hari tradition 6th century bc this is phonocentric cognition centric speech to reality in western linguistics which started with aristotle sosier chomsky this is the line of work very very rich line of work that uh, was in 4th century bc and then a revival in 19th century in the west linguistics is writing centric okay whereas in india uh, the ling the linguistic tradition is phonocentric or speech centric for a long time we did not have any writing system okay and the linguistic knowledge or any kind of uh, knowledge used to be passed passed down through oral tradition veda for example veda was always in oral tradition and since memory is aided by rhythm chand okay and phonetics and accent there are prescribed rules for how words are are to be pronounced that was very strictly controlled so this is the speech centric tradition whereas in the west the writing tradition evolved much early lot of records are kept through writing system that's why this linguistics is writing centric then uh, we say that uh, the speech is a depiction of reality in india indian linguistics we have this curious position that speech controls real reality okay whatever i am saying that is controlling the reality that's a bit subtle okay maybe not, we do not go into those details now and the western position is that it is the reality outside which controls what is spoken okay so that's a very very diametrically opposite view and if any of you uh, are interested in a deep discussion you are welcome okay we can talk about it separately so the components of linguistics are phonetics study of sound and sound elements automatic speech recognition and text to speech requires these foundations phonology study of arrangement of sound elements again requires these uh, foundations asr and tts morphology is the is the study of words this is where nlp begins syntax is the study of arrangement of words to form a sentence semantics is study of meaning pragmatics is study of language use in our lab, lab we are now deeply studying what kind of fault lines you can observe in large language models with respect to pragmatics what is pragmatics pragmatics is language in use okay so again my favorite example is i am sitting in the mess table and i point to the jug of water and say is that water wo pani hai kya meaning thereby please pass me that water of course you can say ha ye pani hai and that's all okay so then there is a violation of a pragmatic principle called maxim of quantity so we we have undertaken this study of pragmatic fault lines in large language model okay very deep study then semantics is the study of meaning etc etc so this is nlp now the interface of speech and nlp has to combine all these and a student of linguistics goes through all these stages understanding these basic concepts so linguistic strata versus languages linguistic study of uh, you know all these linguistic phenomena can be mapped to various languages for example i might want to study 
the phonetics and phonology of Hindi okay? or maybe the morphology of Swahili or uh, se semantic pragmatics elements in Tamil and so on. These are language specific studies. Okay. Are there uh, Hindi specific uh, phenomena in phonetics? There are many. There are many. Okay. Uh, and then morphological complexity of Swahili, etc., etc. And when we bring engineering into the picture, then NLP uh, systems have to be created. So, in the realm of sound, we would like to create automatic speech recognition system, text to speech recognition system. When we are realm of structure, in the realm of structure, we want morphology analyzers, part of speech taggers, named entity recognizer, chunkers, parsers. And in, in the domain of meaning, semantic role labeling, knowledge networks or knowledge graphs, sentiment analysis, uh, emotion analysis, okay, then opinion mining, question answering system, summarizer, all these are in the domain of meaning. And they can be for specific languages. For example, a semantic role leveler for Swahili, or question answering system for Telugu. Okay? So, the same matrix which had uh, linguistic studies can have NLP engineering systems based on those principles. Now, this is very interesting that uh, all almost 90 percent of the languages in the world keep the subject before the object. So, Hindi is an example of SOV, the verb goes to the end. So, 43.3 percent of the languages of the world follow this order, subject, object, verb. SVO 40 percent, VSO about 10 percent. So, 90 percent of the languages keep the subject before the object. That is again a, an intriguing fact, why subjects come before the object. But do we see uh, object coming before the subject? Yes, we see it in Malagasy language in Madagascar. There is no dominant order in Sanskrit. Object also can come in the front of the sentence. For example, in Korean and many times in Japanese. Object, subject, verb, there is a language called Warao in Venezuela, which has this structure. So, you see all possible orders. But the dominant order is subject coming before the object. Verb can be uh, placed, uh, you know, depending on its uh, language family. Then we will also know about language families. This is called a typology tree. So, uh, for example, Indian languages, the major groups are Indo Aryan, Dravidian, Austro Asiatic, and Tibeto Burman. So, where do they? Uh, appear okay. Tibeto Burman languages are in the northeast. Austroasiatic are two languages, Khasi and Munda. Dravidian are in the South India and Indo Aryan, north in north northern part of the country. They again have their subdivisions. So, Dravidian languages, South Central Dravidian and South Dravidian. Telugu uh, is in South Central Dravidian, Kannada, Tamil, and Malayalam are under South Dravidian. This tree has a lot of uh, influence in NLP, especially for transfer learning. So, when you have created a, an NLP system for a language, for its closed sister, often the creation of a new system is much easier. You straight away apply transfer learning. Some th whenever we are mentioning linguistics, we have to say something is about Panini from our own country has been discovered and rediscovered multiple times, first time by Semitic linguists, Arabic and Hebrew scholars. They came to the country and they rediscovered the contribution of Panini. So, he gave a rule based description of Sanskrit language. There are about 4000 sutras, sutras are like formula. This book is called Ashtadhyayi, eight chapters of four divisions each, main contribution is phonology and morphology. Phonology means how sounds patterns are created and how word formation rules operate. Okay. You have to say jaunga, okay, khayenge. So those are word formation rules. Now there are interesting word formation rules for uh, what is called portmanteau words. You have heard the word branch. Branch, what is branch? 
breakfast plus lunch okay this is brunch do you know what is a spork 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 is spoon plus fork okay it is spoon but only at the end you have fork like protrusions okay do you know what is uh, this com googleation unlikely this com googleation this com googleation any guess what could that mean hmm this com googleation is discomfort at not being able to use google <clears throat> If you are not able to use Google, then you feel very discomforted. And <laughs> there is a new word called discombobulation. Okay, and there are interesting uh, new, you know, new new uh, verbs, new uh, new nouns created because of technology. Do you know the answer of this question? Oh, I'll Google and find out. So Google is a new verb. Okay. Give me a copy of this book. Well, I'll Xerox and bring it. Came because of technology, right? But there are very interesting morphological rules, and uh, I mentioned chalawing. Okay, so where chalana is Hindi root and ing is English suffix. That also happens. So uh, Ashtadhyayi is a very very fundamental work. Generations, centuries have discovered and rediscovered and. Have expressed their, you know, wonderment at how such a foundational work could be done 2,000 years back. So phonology is study of sound and elements, phonemes. Phonology is sound study of arrangement of sound elements. Morphology is study of words. Syntax is study of arrangement of words to form a sentence. Semantics is study of meaning. Pragmatics is study of language use. So note this slide carefully. NLP attempts to create NLP and speech attempts to create algorithms for all this and has been doing it for 50 years 50 60 years the new thing is that everywhere now there is use of data and machine learning that is the new thing but the use of data is not new for language as I have mentioned before, linguists are actually data scientists. They collect language data and observe patterns, except that they forget to give probability. Okay? They say that this is it, this is the pattern with 80 percent probability. I mean, there will be exceptions. Of course, I am not completely true because in Ashtadhyayi or Panini, you see rules and exceptions to those rules. Without a quantification, that is the point. Okay, as engineers and scientists, you should think about it. That exceptions are given, but uh, quantification is not there. Quantification is a new thing, which is in the form of ratio of counts coming from the data. Yeah, in semantics, again, uh, there are interesting phenomena like meaning shift. What is the meaning of silly? Do you know? What is silly? Is it a positive or negative word? Mostly negative. But original meaning of silly was joyful, happy and joyful. The meaning shifted over time. And why we need to, you know, that is the job of historical linguistics. So phones, uh, okay, the first element of uh, uh, linguistic structure is phone. So phone, phoneme, and allophone. Now I'll you know just throw some terms without going into those details. Just one class for linguistics to be elaborated as we go forward. So, so this is like you know uh, showing the teeth of an elephant. Hati ka daat dikhana jaise. So there is a big big iceberg below. <laughs> Only the tip of the iceberg is being shown. So phone is any sound. For example, sound of a car braking. Phonemes are sounds realized by human vo vocal tract expressed by the IPA list. So this human vocal tract starting from here up to the lip, whatever sound that produces, this is called the phoneme. So human language space is phonemes, language cognitive space is phones, not necessarily speech sounds. So phonetics is the study of uh, speech sounds 
there is articulatory phonetics study of sound that humans produce their kinds and how they are produced acoustic is physical properties of sound amplitude frequency harmonics which you have read in your physics cl classes auditory is how physical sound is perceived for example amplitude is corresponds to loudness frequency corresponds to pitch harmonics corresponds to quality how do we distinguish between male voice and female voice even though amplitude and frequency can be same still we distinguish we distinguish because of harmonics and it is necessarily subjective so articulatory acoustic auditory all these are uh, branches of phonetics and there is a writing system called phonetic transcription there is an ipa chart which is uh, the standardization of sounds okay now this is the vocal tract this is the nasal area this is called the alveolar reg region this is the velar region glottal region dental region so where and and tongue plays a very important role where wherever the tongue stops the sound okay depending on that a particular category of sound is produced for example ka kha ga ga there the air is stopped uh, at the velar region here for pa pha ba ba you will have to stop the air by pressing the lips together try pronouncing pa pha ba ba without closing the lips you will not be able to do you cannot keep the lips open and pronounce pa no hmm? similarly ma na these sounds are produced by passing the air through the nasal tract so this is an elaborate study of phonetics and all the phonetic sounds that means the speech sounds which are produced by human vocal cord they have been categorized in the form of what is called an ipa chart international phonetic association sim symbols sim symbols i'm getting an echo getting an echo from okay and uh, the vowels vowels which play a very important role they are also categorized properly so vowels are uh, categorized into back vowels front vowel high vowel low vowel mid vowel okay so u for example when you pronounce u the tongue goes back and uh, high up in the oral cavity for e okay the tongue comes in the front and for a the oral cavity is maximally expanded so vowels do play a very important role and uh, we must uh, notice that such a chart has been created for placement of vowels and ipa symbols capture all possible sounds in all languages okay many of the sounds do not exist in indian languages this is called the ipa chart and this is the vowel map now the next uh, element in linguistics is combining these sounds to produce longer uh, sound systems namely words and here there is an interesting statement phonetics gathers the raw material and phonology cooks it so an example of this is the syllable structure so suppose uh, you have this word inscrutable inscrutable and you can very intuitively see that there are four syllables in this inscrutable now there are phonological rules for example you you are unlikely to say ins crut able why don't you divide it this way why is the natural div division this in then screw then te and then bal why not in crut a bal why not okay so there are principles based on energy and those are called sonority principles which decide how the syllabification of the words happens and i can tell you it has been extremely difficult to create systems nlp systems speech systems which divide words into syllables i can you know propose that some some groups in the class creates a syllabifier okay take any word and divide it into syllables try this 
So when we have syllables, we have two uh, large parts in it. There is this uh, onset and rhyme. Under rhyme, we have nucleus. Nucleus is typically the vowel and then coda. So there is this notion of full syllable where all parts are present. Ball, for example, ba is onset, nucleus is the verb and la is the coda. This part is called rhyme because uh, that is what is used for creating poetry. So ball will rhyme with what? Call. And why? Only the onset is changing. The rhyme part is it is same in both words. Then only two words are said to rhyme. Okay. When ChatGPT is producing a poem, how has it got a sense of syllable and rhyming? How has it got it? Where did ChatGPT got it? Get its syllabifier? How does it rhyme? The sense of rhyme in us comes from a sense of syllables and the meter and the rhythm. So that was, you know, just an atomic glimpse of phonetics and phonology, which ASR TTS have to use. Morphology is word formation rules. There are two kinds of morphemes, free morphemes and bound morphemes. Free morphemes are uh, open category words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and also functional category words like prepositions, pronouns. Bound morphemes are those which cannot stand alone. Okay, take the suffix li or ing or er, player, cricketer, footballer. They do, do not stand on their own in the sentence. They have to combine with another word. So that's why they are called mount, bound morphemes. So bound morphemes can be of two kinds, inflectional morpheme and derivational morpheme. So in derivational morpheme, the part of speech of the word typically changes. Play is verb, player is noun. Okay, But in inflectional morphology, the part of speech does not change. For example, plural morphemes, boy, boys, boy is a noun, boys is also noun. Okay? So there are two kinds of bound morphemes. Now there is this notion of root, prefix and suffix. When we create morphology analyzer in NLP, we have to be sensitive to the roots, prefix and suffixes. So for example, undoable, the root is do. Prefix is un, which is a negation prefix. Suffix is able. So there is an interesting example of the word unlockable. Think about the meaning of unlockable. What is the meaning of unlockable? That's one meaning. Something that cannot be locked and also something that cannot be unlocked, that can be unlocked. Okay, Something that cannot be locked as well as something that can be unlocked. Then there, there are these case roles. The main verb plays a very important role in the sentence. Then we have uh, time, place, agent, object, location, instrument, these are called semantic roles. They are uh, supremely important for any question answering system. So there is this sentence, John teaches the children drawing with colored chalks every day in the school. Instrument is colored chalks, who is teaching? John. Whom are they teaching? Beneficiaries, children. What does he teach? Object, drawing. Where? School. When? Every day. So these are essential semantic roles. And the meaning of a sentence emerges from correct semantic roles. The words uh, undergo what is called transformation. Nouns undergo declension. Those of you who, who study Sanskrit have gone through these uh, Shabda Rupas and Dhatu Rupas. So this is again the contribution of grammarians like Panini, extremely well coded and the algorithms are very easy to design, rule based algorithms. Now 
in morphology there is this analytic synthetic spectrum uh, as we move from from the from north to the south we see more and more synthetic languages whereas in the northern part there are more analytic languages okay so this uh, this matrix is useful if there is overloading of grammatical features uh, yes or no and then stacking of mor morphemes yes or no these are the two axes on which morphology is discussed so if both are yes stacking of morphemes as well as overloading of grammatical features then such languages are called agglutinative fusional turkish dravidian languages are both if uh, there is uh, there is uh, not you do not have much overloading of grammatical features such languages are called agglutinative and uh, there is uh, no stacking of morpheme no overloading of features those are called isolating languages vietnamese and chinese are those languages isolating fusional languages are english and indo european languages this is an extremely helpful matrix what do i mean by this so let me uh, you know explain one or two concepts here stacking of morphemes means joining of morphological particles so undoable this shows a stacking of morphemes un do and able will go this shows the opposite behavior this is an isolating behavior will go when i go to hindi do you have stacking of mor morpheme for will go i will go is there stacking of morpheme or not there is so ja and unga are being joined together okay i think i mentioned this to the new students in the first introductory lecture my favorite example of stacking is ghara samor chani from marathi ghar ke samne wale ne unproductivity okay so that there, there you we see stacking of morphemes and overloading of morphemes means do you have the same morpheme playing playing multiple roles so when i say jayenge jayenge is there overloading so uh hum jayenge is fine right first person plural uh aap jayenge is okay in hindi aap jayenge so this is first for, uh, third person singular number so you see the feature has changed the same enge suffix has different no number and person so when this happens we call overloading of morphemes so will in english is extremely overloaded i will go will from will i cannot uh, tell is it we will go or i will go you will go she will go he will go nothing is clear from will so will is very very overloaded okay so languages which have overloading of morphemes pose challenges at at the very lowest level of natural language processing syntax is structure so there we have to create parse trees This is a very famous sentence in English. I saw a boy with a telescope. I saw a boy with a telescope. So this has two meanings. It is not clear who has the telescope. Hmm? मैं दूरबीन से लड़के को देखूँगा. मैं दूरबीन वाले लड़के को देखूँगा. Two different meanings. And the parse tree also becomes different. You see, saw a boy with a telescope. Here, who has the telescope? And here who has the telescope this is another parse tree here uh, i have the telescope and here the boy has the telescope why because boy with the telescope is under the same subtree boy here boy is under np with the telescope is under pp np pp these are very important symbols in nlp np is noun phrase pp is preposition phrase we will have to make use of these symbols all the time 
and then you have another kind of parsing called dependency so i saw a boy with a telescope i is agent boy is the object a boy a is a modifier with a telescope with a telescope this whole phrase is a modifier for the boy so that's why it is coming like a chain and if i have the telescope it's a dip different tree i saw object boy a boy with a telescope here telescope is the instrument for seeing so i have the telescope okay so so uh, a, a parsing is controlled by what is called a grammar okay and grammar these days come with uh, probability values so 1.0 0.5 0.3 etc so uh, this grammar and an algorithm produces a parse tree now one of the parsing algorithms we will uh, study is called cyk parsing so this uh, creates a, this works with a matrix and progressively the words are grouped together so first the gunman is grouped spread then the building is grouped okay this is called cyk parsing a very elegant method of parsing so you see so this is the way there is an animation for this and we finally get the parse tree through cyk parsing okay next uh, we come to some uh, some capabilities of large language models large language models have their you know linguistic ability apparently they are trained on huge amount of data and that gives them linguistic ability so prompting on pum uh, can uh, produce this kind of uh, question formation from declarative sentences okay susan must live must susan live harry can swim can harry swim okay so this uh, large language models can form questions very easily which human beings learn through grammar classes so bill could be sleeping mary has been reading the boy who is here left the ploy, the, the player who should have played is injured these are the new sentences i gave to pam which is a large language model from google and interestingly this sentence this sentence could not be done by the pam the player who should have played is injured what is the question form the player who should have played is injured so the question form is should the player the player who should have played is injured what is the question form hmm is the player who should have played uh injured is the player who should have played injured human beings can do it what about large language model no should the player who have played be injured so it transferred should in front of the sentence so that is a give away that is not a human being but a computational system human beings never make this mistake never so pam made this mistake okay last summer i tried this so handling center embedding this is a linguistic concept is always difficult even for humans now when you come to meaning semantics so we have uh, knowledge graph structures wordnet is an example of that where uh, this is a this is a form meaning matrix again a very important concept in whole of human intelligence there are forms and what these forms denote so if you have the word bank b a n k is a form so it has the meaning of financial institution river bank dependence okay which are shown in the column so this is the notion of polysemy and same meaning expressed by different words is called synonymy this is a linguistic concept so wordnet graph looks like this house and home they are synonymous concepts the synonymous words and uh, they house and home are a kind of dwelling and abode this is called hypernumeration 
and from a general concept to specific concept the relation is called hyponymy the parts parts are indicated by mirror neighbor relation okay so these are semantic relations these are important linguistic concepts entailment actually creates relationship between actions or verbs we need them when you do natural language inferencing let's say when we do nlp of judicial documents okay a verdict has been created based on fir based on the whole case document all the time we have to make use of entailment there and the notion of entailment has been deeply studied in linguistics and cognitive science so there are two kinds of relationship between words syntactic and paradigmatic paradigmatic relation are by virtue of the uh, word belonging to a particular class okay the so cat is an animal this is called a paradigmatic relation syntactic relation comes because the two words are in the same sentence or corpus syntactic relation is what has given rise to word vectors which is the starting point for deep learning based nlp okay whole thing is based on syntactic relation okay then um, words have what is called uh, desire and uh, this desire of words can be met by other phrases or words for example when i say i am fond that doesn't finish the sentence i am fond of cricket i am fond of nlp okay so unless you introduce of another noun phrase the sentence is not complete so fond has a desire for a preposition phrase a particular preposition of and then a noun so yogyata means the fitness of the word to meet that desire so transitive verbs have the desire of objects i saw so what i ate ate what so this is a matter of semantics then uh, these kind of structures are created for uh, uh, for especially for verbs where the verbs have need for some noun phrases uh, and other verb phrases or preposition phrases so give for example as a verb needs an agent who is giving needs a direct object what is being given and an indirect object who is the beneficiary of this giving activity i gave a book to my friend okay without that give cannot form a complete sentence so arguments uh, so the essential uh, parts of speech that the word give requires is called an argument frame okay so in recently in our research on explanator explain explain explaining systems okay explainability in our recent research on explainability which we are going to submit to a conference very soon we found that in case of intent classification in question answering the main verb and its arguments can be treated as explanatory signals we are trying to propose this as a research idea so this is based on the idea of verbs and their argument frames okay then there is uh, a very very difficult nlp task which is metaphors okay metaphors create give rise to what is called metonymy relation so these are interesting con constructs and i do not know if you can uh, create the, this kind of constructs in indian languages please try for your mother tongue the kettle boiled this is a metaphorical system a uh, uh, sentence the kettle doesn't boil the water in the kettle boiled possessor for possessed where are you parked meaning thereby where is your car parked but we do say this in hindi i think you will have to say apne apna gaadi kaha rakha represent so uh, uh, try to translate this into hindi it will be interesting for you to give this sentence to google translate and see what it does where are you parked the government will announce new targets representatives of the government 
hold for part. I am going to fill up the car with petrol. Do you fill up the car with petrol? No, engine of the car. NLP has to deal with such sentences. Increasingly, chatbots, conversational AI agents are asked to show such abilities. Part for whole. I noticed several new faces in the class. Am I seeing faces? I'm seeing students and their faces. Place for institution. Lalbagh witnessed the largest Ganpati. So one question I have asked in every offering of NLP class, can you think of part part metonymy? One part of the body substituting another part. So when you mean I, you use the word ear. So, so for example, when you, you are seeing the spectrogram of sound signals, you have, you have a very curious expression there. I am seeing the sound. Can you see the sound? You are seeing the spectrogram of the sound. But you use the phrase, I am seeing the sound. Then uh, the proverbs, which again are very important uh, constructs of language, and you cannot ignore them. If you want to create really powerful NLP systems, large, we have to see how large language models deal with proverbs. Nash na jane angan tera is a very famous proverb in Hindi. A bad dancer finds faults with the floor, says it is uneven. Corresponding English proverb is a bad workman quarrels with his tools. French is this, to a good workman, good tools. The Polish phrase is this, it means a bad ballerina gets disturbed by the hem of her skirt. So always the meaning is that uh, you find fault with something else other than yourself. In German you say the horseman is not good, the horse is to be blamed for it. In Turkish, the bride who doesn't dance says the space is narrow. In Spanish, a bad wagoner blames the donkeys. Chinese, one blames the bed to be crooked when one cannot sleep. In Arabic, a bad rider blames the camel. So when you uh, translate proverbs, you cannot translate them literally. It's a big challenge for machine transform systems. So some people in the class, okay, some groups in the class may want to create their project on idioms and proverbs. In Korean, you say a good calligrapher doesn't accuse the writing brush. Vietnamese, a bad workman blames the tools. It is same as English. In Croatian, bad worker handyman blames the tools. Sardinian, a bad worker blames his tools. Russian, a bad dancer is bothered by the sleepers. So somebody is bl blaming the floor, somebody is blaming the skirt, somebody is blaming the sleepers, but never hurts it. Okay. Then we, I tried some metaphor experiments on palm and uh, because of want of time, I'll just uh, gloss over it. Palm could produce metaphorical sentences from ordinary sentences after some prompting. Okay. So I gave, I am drowning in a sea of grief. The output should be, I'm having a lot of grief. That is the prompt given. He really flared up my temper. He really made me angry. I am feeling blue. I am feeling sad. This is the prompt I gave to palm large language model of Google. And when I gave uh, te uh, testing sentences, it is raining cats and dogs, palm could produce, it is raining heavily. Mowing the lawn was a walk in the park, mowing the lawn was easy. Making chocolate chip cookies is a piece of cake, palm produced making chocolate chip cookies is easy. Rohan is a night owl, Rohan is a person who stays up late at night. Bill is an early bird, Bill is an early riser. So all these uh, uh, Palm could do. And we have created a system which detects the metaphor score of a sentence. Okay, I'll give you the demonstration of that in the next class. The opposite problem is more difficult. You give an ordinary sentence and you have to produce, an, uh, produce a metaphorical sentence out of it. So I prompted Palm, the area became warm. You should produce warm blanket at the area. This is a very good thing to have additionally. This is an icing on the cake. I am feeling sad, I am feeling blue. So when I tested Palm, his words were very harsh. Palm produced his words were like a dagger. I sense the failure coming, I sense doom and bloom. So all this Palm could produce. Okay. 
Now here is the problem easy or difficult? How, how is pump doing this? Most probably because of the huge amount of corpus, it has seen this association of normal sentences and metaphorical sentences. So though lo it looks very impressive, most probably it is not so difficult if you have trillions and trillions of token. Now semantics is often expressed by predicate calculus and there we have to use of for use for all there exists etc. There is model theoretic semantics. Let me finish by going into a bit of pragmatics which is the last layer of linguistics and really a very challenging frontier for NLP. Pragmatics is language in use. So when the priest is conducting a wedding ceremony in the church, I pronounce you man and wife. So the priest is pronouncing man and wife and it achieves an effect. It makes a man and a, a woman bound in the relationship of husband and wife. So uh, there are uh, pragmatic elements called diaxis. Now, then, here, there, personal, I, you, etc. They are pragmatic constructs in the language. Presupposition, speech acts, politeness is uh, a pragmatic task, and there is increasingly the demand for making chatbots more and more polite. Okay, and uh, Then finally, psycholinguistics. So in psycholinguistics, we know that uh, brain has designated areas for language. Okay, so there is something called Broca's area and Warnick's area. So uh, if there is damage to Broca's area, then syntax is fine, but semantics goes wrong. Okay, we if, if we can speak completely nonsense sentences with perfect syntax but does not make any sense. The opposite problem happens when Warnick's area gets damaged. So in psycholinguistics we know that 0 to 6 months the child language development is very reflexive, cry, cough, crying, coughing, hiccup and non-reflexive cooing, comfort sounds, vocalization, etc. 6 to 12 months the child babbles and it produces reduplicate sounds, ba, 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 ma, 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 ma and so on. And 10 to 18 months, one word utterances. 16 to 24 months, two word sentences. It is called monomorphosynthetic burst. 20 months to 30 months, telegraphic speech. Almost no function words and affixes, only root nouns and root verbs. And 30 months onwards, full utterances. So after about two and a half year, the child begins to produce full sentences. Okay, so uh, so this is the point. Uh, linguistics is the eye, and computation is the bo body. We need data, machine learning, probability, etc., for effective NLP systems. But in the background, always theory is there. Okay, coming from linguistics, uh, philosophy, cognitive science. So this is what I wanted to show to you. Just uh, wait for two three minutes. The seat belt is on. So the last class was on some important concepts from maths mainly probability and matrix and uh, today's class was on important concepts from linguistics. So it is very, very, very quick exposition of important terms. As we go forward, we will uh, keep needing them, discussing many things like semantics, parsing and so on. But do refer to these slides off and on as the course proceeds. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.